this child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb, redeem. His child and forever I am. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for a wonderful evening that you've given us so far. Thank you for the time that we've had uh, in prayer and fellowship so far. And Lord, we ask that you be with the preaching of your word this evening. As pastor brings it, Lord, allow our hearts and our minds to be open. And Lord, we just ask that everything that's said and done tonight be to glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, if you could, let's turn over to page 410. Page 410. And as we're turning over there, again, just a few quick announcements. July 11th through 15th, so next Tuesday, uh, begins the Good News Five-Day Bible Club. So be in prayer for that as we're excited to uh, see what God will do there. Uh, thankful for everyone who came out yesterday for the uh, time of fellowship for July 4th. Uh, and then on September 9th, we have track distribution and blitz at 10.30 a.m. So be here at the church on September 9th for the track distribution blitz. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and sing 410. We're only going to sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. And then I'll ask the men to come up on the last verse for the offering. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Page 410, verse 4. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing.
standing on the promises of God on the last. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Let's pray for the offering. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We just ask that you be with us now as we collect the offering, Lord. And we just ask that you use it to bless uh, your uh, kingdom and your work here, Lord. And God, we're just thankful for the opportunity we have to give back a portion of what you've given us, Lord, and help us to give with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Sister Rebecca. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Good evening. Welcome to Hampton Roads Independent Baptist Church for our midweek services. We've had a time of prayer, and we certainly do need to pray. And we thank God for uh, the Lord giving us an, another year of, as a nation. And, of course, another day that we get to serve him in this great United States of America. And, of course, uh, we always going to get people that are going to complain and, and about how bad America is and talk trash about it. And, of course, you get NBA stars and celebrities and all these folks. Listen, uh, some of you may have heard of a man by the name of his name is Freedom Cantor now. He, he, uh, he's, I think he's from Turkey. And uh, he was a, he was an NBA basketball star, but because of his stand for freedom and liberty, and the thing that, that he's a, a naturalized citizen here in the United States of America, and so he can't get to play basketball anymore because of his stand for just for freedom in America. So he, he changed his name to uh, Freedom Cantor. It was uh, uh, Enos, I believe. I forget what what for, but he changed his name because he is so appreciative of the freedom that he enjoyed in the United States of America. He can't even go back to his own home country. Uh, they have they had a contract on him to kill him if he went back because of uh, his stand for freedom because the nation that he's from they don't have the liberty and freedom that he enjoy here in the United States of America and he he's going around the country now and really trying to present to uh, Americans uh, how really good we have it yet we don't really understand uh, to the degree that we have it so good and that's just a, the mercy of the grace to bless them God upon our lives but I'm glad to be an American citizen glad to be here tonight and we're going to be glad that we can be uh, citizens of heaven too uh, one day uh, right now we're on earth and we're here but one day you're going to be glad that you were saved born again by the spirit of God and you're going to be so glad that you obeyed God to the best of your ability to the degree that you could and uh, all of us are imperfect and we know that we're never going to do everything that we need to do right according to the word of God but you're going to be glad you did the best you could uh, while you're here if you are a citizen of heaven and if you are born again you are indeed a citizen of heaven as Philippians tells us I want you to take your Bible tonight we're going to look at some very precious promises in the word of God tonight and I'm, a, I'm going to try to talk clearly and uh, uh, not stutter too much and just say some things that really ought to move our hearts and serve to understand what we have in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just got down on our faces and knees and in our hearts and we prayed and we asked God to do some things to save some lost sinners, to make some things right in the lives of people and take care of by his grace certain situations that we can't do anything about. And uh, if, we, if we need to understand that we're praying to this God, we need to believe him because of who he is and what he's done. So I want you to take your Bible tonight Turn to Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter number four. And I'm going to pick up where I left off 
last week, but I'm going to just make some statements here, and then I'll get to the verse I want to preach on tonight. Hebrews chapter number 4, uh, let's pick up in verse number 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of son of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, there is a throne of grace. God sits on a throne of grace. The Lord Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father at a throne of grace. Think if it was a throne of just justice, a throne of revenge, a throne of judgment. But it's a throne of grace. And God says we can call upon him as, as we, he sits on that throne of grace. Let's pray again. Lord, we are thankful again tonight for the people of God. Lord, uh, you know I'm concerned. My heart is burdened. I'm con concerned about uh, the mindset, the condition of Christian people. And, Lord, concerned about churches. I'm concerned about this local assembly and the, the, uh, those who have, Lord, uh, agreed to, to come together, to fellowship together in this place. And I'm concerned, Lord, about uh, what we uh, do and what we think and how we go about the work of God and to be able to worship you. So I pray you might help us, dear God. And I pray you help me as a, as a preacher, as a Christian, as a pastor of a local assembly to know what to do, how to go about the work of God in a way that is pleasing to you. And we'll thank you. We'll praise you for what you do in each of our lives now as we give ourselves in obedience to your word. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, is Miss Perkins OK? OK. All right. Let's see how I can encourage you tonight, Christian at Hampton Roads, and those who may be watching online, uh, I don't know, but uh, the Holy Spirit has appealed to the first century Jewish believers, and some of them are believers, some of them are non-believers, uh, they've heard the word of God, they, but they don't really believe it, some of them are, uh, are non-believers that have heard the word of God, and and they don't believe it, but they, they have a, a hostility towards it, and they don't want to believe it, and they refuse to believe it. As Hebrews chapter 4 says, they did not mix it with faith, and basically said that they refuse to hear the truth. And so as you look at these uh, three groups of believers, uh, not believers, a Christian, uh, uh, some of them are Christians, some of them are unbelievers. They've heard the word of God. They're not really believers. They made, Some of them have made professional faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, on Sunday morning, uh, on purpose, I am preaching a message that I've entitled, uh, uh, examine yourself, make sure you're in the faith because of the condition of the, in the mindset of people that claim to be saved, but they they have no fruit in their lives. Uh, they, they're, they're thinking is contrary to the word of God. They seem to have no Holy Spirit conviction, though they can live habitually in sin. And so I'm concerned about that. And so I'm preaching, uh, dealing with, with that on Sunday morning, but the point of it is, it said in Hebrews, there were some people like that. They professed to be saved, but they didn't live like they were saved. And then some of those who were actually born again were going back to Judaism, going back to the old ritualistic ceremonies, trying to have salvation or thought that it, that it was better than what they had in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I could preach uh, chapter one through four verbatim what I've preached before, but basically he's just saying that Jesus Christ is just superior to everything you know. He's superior to the prophets, to angels, to Moses, to Joshua. And now he's going to talk in the verse that we look at tonight, he's going to talk about the fact that uh, Jesus Christ as a great high priest is superior to Aaron who was their uh, high priest that was anointed by God, chosen by God, consecrated by Moses there in the book of uh, Exodus and uh, Leviticus. But as you look at... Uh, this book of Hebrews now, the thing that we've said, the Holy Spirit appeals, he said, listen, don't harden your heart to the voice 
of the Spirit of God as he gives you this New Testament message. He said, this is the message about Jesus Christ. Now, in Hebrews chapter 2, he says, don't allow this message to slip by you. He said, take heed to yourselves unless you let these things slip by. He said, take heed. He said, listen, there's a judgment for allowing the message of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, presented it to you. God is a witness that he did. The apostles have also presented it. He said, don't let this message get by you because there is not another message that's going to benefit you as this message will benefit you if you receive it, mix it with faith. It is the message of salvation, and you can't have salvation outside of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, so don't let this message get by you. He said, harden not your heart. So three times now in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, you find in chapter 3, verse number 7, he says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. I explained all those words, and basically they had come to the point where the nation of Israel, because of their disobedience and because of their rebellion, they had made God so angry, they had provoked God, they had tempted God, they were, they were, they were judging God by their standards, and they were saying, based on our standards, God, you don't fit the bill. You don't meet our standards. You can't our standards are, are so high, or our standards are such that the God that the, that Jesus Christ is, or the God that being the message talks about, you don't meet our standards. And so they put God to the test. They said they had proved Him, they had tempted Him, or they uh, had uh, provoked Him. And basically, God says He had come to the point where He swore in His wrath. He said, "Listen, if they enter into my rest, then I'm not God." He said, if they enter into my rest, he said, I swore by myself, if they enter into my rest, then I, I, I am not Jehovah. So basically what God was saying is this, if, if they go into the land of promise, if they go into the land that flows with milk and honey, if they go into the land of Canaan, he said, then there is no God because I'm not him. And there's only one true and living God. And so he said, now, be in fear. He said in verse 1 of chapter 4, he said, he said, fear, therefore, he said, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So last week we looked at God's promised rest. And God had promised a rest. He said, but you can only have this rest by putting faith in in this, my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, don't miss it. Don't let it get by you. Don't let it slip. He says again in, in 3 or 15, he says, again, for uh, verse number 5, it said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. He says again in chapter 4, down in verse number 7. Again, he limited a certain day saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. The limited time, and he's talking about there, and then that, that, listen, the only time you have to hear the Spirit of God speak to you is that before you die. After death, the only time you have is that space of God given from birth to death. But once you die, there is no more message of salvation for you. And as the point unto men, once to die. But after this, the message of salvation. No, it doesn't say that. It says, but after this, the judgment. And so the, 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 the limited time, it says, again, he limited a certain day, and that certain day is today. Basically saying that today, right now, this is the time. He says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted time of salvation. He says, if you're going to heed this message and hear this message and heed it, he said, you need to do it today. And he says, harden not your heart. The idea of hardening not your heart was basically, he would tell them, you already have hardened your hearts. Some of you have already hardened your hearts. You're insensitive to the voice of the Spirit of God. And he says, your hearts have been hardened. And now, he said, you need to quit it. You need to stop hardening your heart to the Word of God. Because you still have an opportunity. As long as you have breath, as long as you're living, and until God hardens your heart, you have an opportunity to enter into this rest of salvation that only God can bring. 
and this it comes through the person of his son the lord jesus christ so we looked at this rest now i'm not going to go over all these terms about rest but when you get down to verse number eight it says for if jesus had given them rest that's joshua this is not the lord jesus christ this is the word for joshua this is the uh, uh greek rendering of the, uh, uh, joshua it says if, for if jesus had given them rest then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day now, he said, there remained therefore a rest to the people of God. So in that passage of scripture, rest is used about five, six, seven times you see the word rest. But when you get down to verse number nine, the word rest, that's a different word for the word rest. This word is a sabbatical. This is the word, this is like a Sabbath. This is like the rest that only God can give. This is the rest that comes like when God created the world and on the seventh day God rested. This is the rest that comes by being in God's son the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, is, is freedom from, from intention and anxiety and stress and worry and concern. This is a rest. This is a peace, a tranquility. This is a peace in your soul that can only come from God. You understand what I'm saying here tonight? There remain a rest to the people of God. He said, if, if the rest that Joshua brought you to, if going into the land of promise, of the land of Canaan, if that was the rest of the final rest that God meant to give his people, he said then he would not have spoken of another day or of another rest. He's talking about a Sabbath rest. Now, then he said this, verse 11, let us labor. See, there's an urgency about entering into God's rest. Why? He says today. Why is there an urgency? Listen, we just heard today somebody died. That's why there's an urgency to enter into this rest. It's an urgent for, for us as Christians to be the witnesses that we need to be to tell other folks about this rest. There's an urgency. Now, we don't seem to think so. And uh, sometimes uh, in my Christian life, uh, our Christian life goes like it kind of ebbs and flows like this. Listen, it ought not always be going continue like this. It ought to be ebb and flow, but it ought to be continued going up to a higher plane all the time. You know, you have a little downturn, but it ought to be going forward, a little down, but it ought to be going up. It ought to be getting closer and closer to the Lord. We might be decaying in our bodies. Of, of, of think uh, Corinthians tells us our bodies might be dying, we might be decaying, but our spirits ought to be growing stronger day by day. Why? The older we get, the longer we serve the Lord, the more we learn about him, the, the, the more uh, uh, powerful our spirits ought to become, even though our body may be weak and decaying and get our inner man ought to be being strengthened for the things of God. If not, then we're not growing like we ought to. So this earthly body decays, and I don't know the exact scripture there, but it says, listen, our inner man ought to be growing day by day. And so... I get excited, but there's an urgency about entering God's rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter this rest. That's any man fall after the same example of unbelief. He basically saying, listen, you need to be diligent about this thing. You don't know when the next uh, opportunity is going to come where you ever hear this message again. This might be your last church service, your last Hampton Road Independent Baptist Church attendance, your, your last opportunity to hear the God, your last opportunity to witness. It might be your last opportunity to read the Bible, last opportunity to pray. It Listen, it really might be your last opportunity to read the Word of God, to pray to God, to serve God, to do anything for God. We don't know now. We don't think like that. We're not some morbid, uh, uh, dark-minded thinking people all the time, running around thinking about death all the time. We think about living. and But we want other folks to know about this life that we have in Christ. So now he said labor. I mean, this is talking about the intensity and the purpose. It says there's intensity about the purpose of entering into this rest. There's effort to enter into this promised rest of God. See, now he's not talking about working for your salvation. It said, but you need to be earnestly seeking and searching and trying to find out how to enter into this rest. It's not by being baptized and working and what you can do. It's basically putting your faith in what Jesus Christ has already done now. So in these last three verses now of Hebrews chapter 4, so he said there's an urgency about this rest. But in these last verses now, he says this. Last three or four verses. He said, for the word of God is quick, powerful. It's sharp in any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of son of soul and spirits, and of the joints and marrow, and of the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The writer is saying, listen, I don't care how much you profess, how much you say you're saved, how much you say you love God, 
How would you say you're serving the Lord? He said, for the word of God is quick and powerful. The purpose of these verses is to show that we cannot escape the notice of God. Therefore, any dishonest, insincere profession of belief in Christ will be detected by God. That's all he's saying. He said, you know why? He said, you ought to, I want you to labor earnestly to enter into this rest. Lest you uh, fall away, like, lest you fall after the bad example of unbelief of the nation of Israel when it came out of Egypt. So what, listen, he said, listen, don't be like, he, he's been the whole chapter talking about the rebellion, the provocation, the temptation, the tempting God, testing God, hardening their hearts, unbelief. They heard the word of God, didn't mix it with faith. And he said, now, there's an urgency. Don't miss out on this rest because you are just like the Israelites. You've heard the message, the land of promise, the land of rest, a place of rest. But you're not going to enter in because you're just like the Israelites. He said, don't follow their example of unbelief. But then it says, talking to the, these Hebrews which are professing to be believers, yet they have not come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He says, you can profess and pretend as earnestly as you want to, but the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharp and in the two-edged sword. So he knows whether or not you are God or not. And so that's the idea here. He said, I want you to understand that any insincere profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is easily detected by the word of God. He said, to enter into God's rest, we must be honest with ourselves and we have to view ourselves as God views us. Listen, Christian, even as born again believers, if we want God to work in our lives, we have to be honest with ourselves and because the word of God is going to sift us out. If we say, I'm doing all that I can for the things of God, God says, you look at the word of God, you'll find out if you are or not. You see, the word of God sift us through. He's saying the truth of the word of God is, is all penetrating. It's certain. See, the real thoughts and the motives of the heart will be brought to light by the word of God. See, when I say that I, I, I love God, when I get in the word of God, the word of God will tell me, you, it'll say, you really do? When I say, Lord, uh, I, I'm, I'm a devil, I devil my sin, I've forgiven this one, I repent it, and I've, I've done all that I can do. You know what the word of God will do? It'll expose to you whether or not you have or not. It says, are you really telling the truth? Have you really forgiven him or her? Have you really done the best job you can? Have you really sought my counsel on this? Have you really prayed about this? Have you really done all that I would ask you to do? See, the word of God says you can pretend and be dishonest with yourself. But in order for God to work with you, you have to be honest. I learned years ago, there are so many people that would come to an altar. Now, that's a rarity today for people to even come to the altar to admit that they got anything wrong or that God is blessing anything at all. It's a rarity, but the point of it is this. They'll come to the altar and pray about the same thing uh, 10 years and still have the same problem 10 years later. You know why that is? They're not honest in their heart. You know, a lot of people that pray a prayer and ask God to forgive them for their sin and never get saved. They're not honest with God in their hearts. And see, you, we can't fool God in our hearts. And we can fool each other and we can tell stories and tell lies. But when the word of God gets a hold of us, it penetrates our thoughts and intent. It's a discerner. It's a critic of our hearts. Notice what he says here. It's quick. It's, that means it's alive. It's, it's efficacious. I mean, it's not. Listen. It, the word of God is not only alive, it means it is, it, is, it is active alive and it is constantly alive. You understand what I'm saying? It is actively alive and it's always alive. It's constantly working on us when we read it. That's, now, that's another reason why some people don't read it. Because you cannot read the word of God and, and habitually practice your sin, disobey God, and say that you love God. You cannot read the word of God habitually, daily, and tell God you love him and you're reading the word of God. It won't happen. And so, you know what happens? Instead of reading the word of God, we think in our hearts and minds that we're okay with God, and so we set the word of God over here, and then we go about our business saying that we're okay with God. 
God says, until you get honest with me, you won't really be okay. You say you are, but you aren't. And though he says, it's powerful. That word means it's operative. It's, ener it's energy and it, it operates. He said it's sharper. I like this word sharper. It said the word of God is sharper. It means to, to cut incisively. It means to, a precision cut. See, this is what the word of God does. It, it cuts like, like, with like, like a, you ever seen a meat cleaver? Well, instead of just hacking the meat, you get a big old sharp meat cleaver and with one slice, shoo, he says, that, that's how the word of God is. The word of God is not going to hack you, hack you. The word of God is just going to cut it great. Shoo. Tell you right away what's wrong, what's right. Yeah. It's precise. It's active. It's always active. It's decisive. It's like with a single stroke, instead of just having it repeat, hit, hit, hit a, with a, a hammer or a kind of just hack. You know, you get a, a dull saw, a dull blade, you got to hack at it. You ever try to chop down a, a tree with a dull axe? I have. Brother Tim has. I know. He's probably been around. Listen, you get an old dull axe and, you, and you're hitting the tree and, and sometimes a piece of bark fly off and then the, the thing bounced back a little bit and you're like, what is going on? And then you go put it on the on the wet block and you you sharpen it up a little bit and you come back, boy, you start to whoosh, here's a chip fly there. Whoosh, next thing you know, the tree is falling over because you got a sharp axe. That's how the word of God is. Now, I like this. It says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Uh, God taught me something that I, that I did not know when I looked at this verse. I, I always read it before. I memorized it. But it says, it, it says, it's sharpened in into its sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It says, piercing even to the dividing asunder. It's piercing. Piercing. The, the word piercing means it's penetrating. Listen. It, it's, it means it's a going through the soul and going through the spirit. It's, it's not, listen, look up for a moment. It's not talking about separating the soul from the spirit, all right? It's not talking about separating the joints from the marrow. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Because when you read it, you're thinking, saying, the word of God is quick and powerful, it's sharp in the inner so it piercing, that word piercing, means penetrating even to the dividing asunder, or dividing, or separating one from another, separating the soul from the spirit. Well, that's not what it's saying at all. It is the dividing of the elements of a thing in itself by piercing it through. Now, the word of God penetrates the soul and it penetrates the spirit. It's not dividing the soul from the spirit. It is the word of God that penetrates the soul. That's the, 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 the part of a man that tells you that you are a man. That it penetrates your spirit that communicates with God. It said that it penetrates each one of them individually separately. So it's not separating the soul from the spirit. It said that the word of God penetrates a man's soul. It penetrates his spirit just like it would an axe or a sharp sword would penetrate and cut through the, when you cut, if you cut through a man's bone with a sharp sword, you know what, you cut through, see, cause in some bones, there's marrow inside the bones. And so when you cut with a, a sharp sword, you cut through the bone and you cut through the marrow. You don't separate the bone from the marrow, you're cutting through both. It says, so the word of God is penetrated so that it cuts through both the, 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 the soul, it cuts through the spirit, it cuts through the joints, and it cuts through the marrow. Listen, you know what? Joints are the place where the bones meet together. You, you know what? This is what, like, this is a joint. This is a joint. In some bones, there's marrow. Not in all of them, but there in some bones, there are marrow. Marrow, marrow is what produces the red and white blood cells in your body. It says, it's as if the word of God is so penetrating that, see, it talks about the hidden things of your heart. See, if you take my skin off, you can see blood, but you wouldn't see the marrow in my bone. You have to get inside my bone to see the marrow. It said that the word of God cuts down to the recesses where nobody else can see. It cuts the, the soul. It separates the spirit. Spirit, and it cuts down through the joints and the marrow, just like a sword would cut through the joints of a person's body, and the marrow would still be inside the bone. It said it, it, it cuts like that. It's so penetrating. It's so piercing. It's so thorough. It's so precise. It's so sharp that when it slices, and it says it's a discerner, it's a critic. That means it's a judge of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You know what the word intention means? The word of God, it acts on your, the thing that you think about, the thing that you're meditating upon, 
The word of God penetrates those. It says, so therefore, if you're professing to be a Christian and you're professing to love the Lord and you're professing to be one of those that are the ch children of God, he says, you can lie to the preacher, lie to the church, lie to others, but the word of God is penetrating, it's piercing, and it cuts to the very quick of the hidden conditions of the heart. And see, that's why the spirit of God would not convince a lost person that he's a child of God. And when a person hears the word of God, the spirit of God takes the word of God and it cuts him to the very soul. And when he gets up and walk out of a church service where he heard the word of God, he knows that the spirit of God has spoken to him. He just leaves lost and he may pretend to be saved because he thinks that, well, I'm doing what the church does. I'm talking like the church talk and I'm doing everything they do. So I think I'm saved. I'm OK. But the spirit of God won't give him the assurance that he is. He, listen, he'll never have an arrest in his soul because the Bible says there is no rest to the wicked. So you never have that rest. Oh, my goodness. He's a discerner of thoughts and intents of heart. Now, then I like this. this is a, look at this verse. He says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto him, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Learn something else in this study. The word naked means to lay bare, expose. Open means to, to now this is a different word. This word, it means to lay bare as well, but this, there are three meanings. It means like to seize and to twist the neck or the throat. It also means to, to bend the neck of a victim back that's going to be slain. To make his face to be able to, his face is going to be seen. So you're going to take the sword of the word of God and you bend his neck back so you can slay him. It also means to lay back or expose by bending back. And so the word literally means that the word of God and God's word, it says there's no creature, there's none of God's creation, that everything is exposed, everything is bare, everything is open. And he said it's like a person is laying back, about to be slain with his neck thrown back, his face up to God, and he's waiting to be slain, and everything is exposed. That's how we are to God. Now listen to me carefully. But I like this part. And I see that little two words at the end of the verse 13. What, say, what are those two words? To do. You would never even think this, but you know what those, those two words are? It's from the verb to be. It's the word logos. It's the same word. That, in the beginning was the word logos, and the word logos was with God, and the word logos was God. It says, we're naked and open and exposed with our neck thrown back to be slain if said, with him with whom we have to do. The Logos. It means with the one with whom we're going to have to give an account. The one with whom we have to give a reckoning to. It says we are open and naked to the one that we have to give an account to. The one of whom we have to do. And the word to do is the Logos. The idea that there is a day of reckoning coming when we have to give an account to God for the way in which we have treated the New Testament message. That's what he's saying. And then he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And this is the last verse I'm going to preach this evening. But notice here now, in verse number 14, the writer to the Hebrews are already shown, as we've already mentioned a number of times, he's already shown that Jesus is superior to the prophets, superior to the angels. Chapter 3, he's superior to Moses. And in chapter 4, we didn't discuss it a whole lot, but he says in verse number, um, chapter 4, in, in, in verse Number uh, uh, eight, for if Jesus, that's Joshua, had given them rest, then would we not as well have spoken of another day. There remained therefore a rest to the people of God. And so in, in the first uh, four chapters, we've seen all these things that Jesus appeared to. Now, of course, we know he's appeared to everything and anything. But the point is, he says, 
I want you to understand that he's superior to everything you believe in. The prophets, the angels, Moses, Joshua. Then he says to Aaron, he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. As you read the book of Hebrews, there's an ascending order of importance. It starts with the prophet. See, the prophet gave the word of God to Israel. When you read it through the Old Testament, you'll find the prophet gave the word of God to Israel. The word of God was given to the prophets by the disposition of angels. You read in Acts chapter 7, 38. You read Deuteronomy chapter 33. You'll find out that the word of God uh, said there was angels at Mount Sinai. God wrote the word of God on, but it said the word of God was given to the prophets through the disposition of angels. Acts 7, 38 tells us that. Acts uh, Galatians 3, 19 tells us that. Deuteronomy 33 tells us that. Now, you also find that Moses led the Israel, uh, nation of uh, Israel, or the Hebrews, out of Egypt. We know that. Joshua led them into the land of Canaan. Now, all of this would have would not matter a whole lot if they had no way. There was no mediator between God and man because they could go to the land of promise, the land of Canaan. But if they had no way of salvation, no mediator between God and man. See, Moses was a leader. Joshua was a leader, but they were not the mediator between God and man. He says so they needed a mediator between God and man. And so they set up a priesthood. Now, listen. Aaron was chosen by God to be Israel's first high priest. And God commanded Moses to concentrate Aaron and his sons to the priesthood. Turn to Exodus chapter 28, just for a moment. Exodus 28. I made a statement. Aaron was chosen by God to be Israel's first high priest. When Moses was up on the Mount Sinai and God told him, say, listen, when you go, I want you to go and I want you to anoint your brother Aaron and his sons to be a priest to me and to work in the priest's office. Exodus chapter 28, just for a moment. Exodus 28. Everybody there? Oh, good. Well, you can read it for yourself as I'm turning there. But it says, and take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his son with him. From among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And then he says, Even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's son. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Now that, that whole chapter deals with the setting up the priesthood and Aaron being the first high priest. And his sons were going to be priests with him. All right? And of course, we know the story about two of his sons died because they were offered up strange fire. But the point is, so that's where God says, I, I want you to uh, consecrate Aaron. So it talks about the garments that they're going to wear, uh, the, the colors they're going to have on, the ephod, the turban they're going to wear, the breastplate, and all these things. It talks about it throughout the Old Testament. It talks about it in Leviticus. It talks about it in, in books of Numbers as well. But so as a high priest, Aaron represented, the, the he was the most important servant of God's servant uh, out of the, of the prophets, the priests. Aaron was a high priest, so he was one of the most important servants of God's econ economy in the Old Testament. And so now, what the writer is going to show, he says, I want you to understand that Jesus Christ is a greater high priest than Aaron could ever be and than Aaron ever was. Because they understood that they needed somebody to represent them to God and somebody to represent God to them. And so they needed a mediator. Seeing then, back in Hebrews now, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now, the purpose of the priesthood is to have someone to be a mediator between God and man. And listen, God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, brought them unto himself in order that they might be a kingdom of priests. And now, we won't turn all the scripture there, but you read in the Old Testament book of uh, Exodus 19 and other places you find that God had chosen the nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. He wanted them to be a light to the world. It was God's plan that Israel would be a light to the rest of the world. They'd be a holy nation having direct access to God. That was God's plan. Exodus chapter 19, you read there. He said, I want it. I've called them. I've chosen them. I want them to be a kingdom of priests so that they can represent to the rest of the world that's in darkness and sin who I am. Well, since Israel was to be a holy nation, God had given the responsibility to demonstrate his holy standards. But what happened to the nation of Israel? Were they demonstrating God's holy standard to the rest of the world or did they become like the rest of the world? They became like 
the rest of the world. They became like the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and, and the Moabites and, and all those that they came into the land. They, they became like them. As a matter of fact, it came, became so bad that by the time you get to the uh, prophet Jeremiah, God said, listen, they are going into idolatry. They're going into captivity. He's, listen, he's already destroyed the 10 tribes of Israel. 200 years later, here's Judah, the two, uh, Benjamin and Judah, and God said, listen, you, uh, just like your, 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 your backsliding, uh, sister, he says, as is the mother, so is the daughter. He says, I've warned Israel, and now Judah, you're doing the same thing. The only difference is you, listen, they were backsliding, and you are treacherous. You're pretending to love me, but you're doing the same thing they did. God called Judah treacherous. He said, Israel, the, Northern king, they were backsliding, but you were treacherous. He said, you, Israel, Israel, said the ten tribes, they just turned their back on me and serve idols. But Judah, you pretended you love me. You pretended like you serve me, but you're doing the same thing that Israel did. You're not on the backslide. He called them treacherous. He said, you're an impotent people. He called them and said, they were not only sinning against God. He said, they, they were, they, listen, they were fighting against God to stay sinful. Can you imagine? He called them an impotent. The word is I-M-P-U-D-N-T. He called them, you are an impotent people. Not only stiff neck. He said, you are impotent. It means that they were so hard-hearted against God, they were fighting against God to stay sinful. God says, I can't tolerate this anymore. You know what he did? He told Jeremiah, stop praying to me for them. Don't pray to me for them anymore. Three times in the book of Jeremiah, God said, do not pray. Jeremiah, do not pray to me for these people because I will not hear you. Can you imagine how mad God has to be for people to say stop praying to him for them? We just got down on our knees and prayed. He said, and he said, seeing then that we have a great high priest. That high priests are mediated between God and men. He said, we have a great high priest. Now listen. So Israel sinned against God, breaking the covenant which he had made with them at Mount Sinai. Thus they forfeited the privilege of being a nation of priests. And so what God did, it became necessary for God. He instituted a priesthood and he made Aaron the first priest and then he made the Levites those who be priests after Aaron, all his descendants. So while Moses was on the Mount Sinai, now we just read in Exodus 28, God said to him, take Aaron and thy brothers and his sons. And he said, I want you to anoint them. And he did just that. And so now, but notice about this high priest. Now, I like this. Aaron was, 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 it says, seeing then that we have a high priest. Notice what happened. That is passed into the heaven. See, Aaron was a high priest. And he, he also passed into the heavens when Jesus took the Old Testament saints from Hades to heaven when he ascended down and ascended up on high after the resurrection. That's in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 8 through 10, Colossians chapter 2. I, that's a wonderful story. And listen, Jesus Christ, when he ascended on high, so he led captivity, captive, meaning he, he took the uh, uh, captives of uh, the Old Testament saints out of the, the uh, paradise side of Hades and took them to be in the presence of God. And then it said, the Bible said, the hell has enlarged herself. Because Christ says he ascended and then he descended and he led captivity high and he gave gifts to men. That's Ephesians 4, 8 and 10. Colossians says, as he ascended on high, the principalities and the powers tried to prevent him from taking the blood of a sacrifice to the holy of holies in the heavenlies. Let me help you out here now. See the word of passing to? It means to go through. It says he passed into the heavens. It means that he passed through the heavens. Now notice, it doesn't say heaven. It says heavens with an S. You see it? Don't miss it. This is a completed action that has results right now. See, Aaron as a high priest would pass. When Aaron went in the, in the Holy of Holies into the tabernacle, listen, you got to read the Old Testament, read the book of Leviticus, read the book of Numbers, read about these sacrifices. But when, when, listen, when Aaron as a high priest would pass through the court of the tabernacle, he would pass through the, the, the he would go through a door into the tabernacle, into the outer court. Then he would go through the holy place, and then he would pass through a veil, and then behind the veil was the mercy seat, was the holy of holies. It was the mercy seat overlaid with gold, the, the cherubim, the covereth, and the ark of the covenant was there. And that's where the blood of all those sacrifices would be applied in the tabernacle, in the holy of holies, to make an atonement for the sins of the people. Now listen, as a high priest, Aaron went in once a year. 
But no, you know what he had to do first? He had to make a sacrifice and atonement for his own sin because Aaron, just like the people he was representing, was a sinner. So before Aaron could offer sacrifice, he had to make an offer for himself. Look in Hebrews chapter 5. Look down to verse 3. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sin. And the reason why he did that, because he was a sinner. Now, that was Aaron. That's the, the, uh, the Aaronic priesthood. God instituted. God set it up. But now, keep in mind what the writer to the Hebrews is trying to show to you. That, listen, I want you to understand, a, a Jewish Christian. I want you to understand, those that are hearing me, that Jesus Christ is a superior priest. He has a superior priesthood to what Aaron has. Though Aaron was the first high priest, it, it has no comparison to the high priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, number one, Jesus passed into the heaven. Now, the little phrase passed into means he passed through the heaven. Now, note, see, as Aaron went, Aaron would go into the outer court, to pass the brazen altar. He would go into the Holy of Holies, pull back the veil, go into the Holy of Holies, and sprinkle the blood. Well, when Jesus went to make an atonement for sin, he went through the atmosphere of heaven, to celestial heaven, and then he went to the third heaven. That's why I said the heavens. He passed through all three to get to God the Father. See, in the tabernacle, there, there was a Shekinah glory. It was only the representation of God. But in the Holy of Holies, in the heavenlies, it's the abode of God. That's where God dwells. It's just not the Shekinah glory of God. It's God himself in the heavens of heaven. That's where Jesus offered his sacrifice. One time. Forever. Sat down. Now listen, let me, let me give some comparison. See, when Aaron went to offer sacrifice, he did not sit down. He did not delay. He had to make a sacrifice for himself first because he was a sinner. Before he could atone for the nation of Israel, he had to offer a sacrifice for his own sin. And, 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 Pray that God accept it, lest he die in the tabernacle. As soon as sacrifice was made, he had to leave out, and it did not return until another year to make an atonement for the sin of the nation of Israel. See, that, that ritual was performed every year. Hebrews chapter 10, notice. Why was it performed every year? It was simply to remind the nation of Israel that the blood of bulls and goats and calves could not take away your sin. It was not, uh, listen, it was just a reminder. Now, you can read the verse in Hebrews 10, it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which, which they offer year by year continue to make the comers there too perfect. He said, If they could, for then would they uh, not have ceased to be offered. Yes, they would have. If they could, if they could have made the comers there too perfect or mature, or they could wash away their sin, they would not need to be offered again. Because that, the worst of one's prayers should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Verse number 11. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. But this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, the one that is passing into heaven, this man, as he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14. So when Jesus now passed through the first heaven, the second heaven, and into the third heaven, he offered one sacrifice for sin forever. Notice what he did. He sat down on the right hand of God. He didn't have to leave. After Aaron and all the other earthly high priests offered their sacrifices, they would have to leave the Holy of Holies. Jesus Christ went to where God is, not simply to the place where his glory dwelt. Jesus did not have to leave. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty and on high. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, He purged uh, said, by himself. He purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty and on high. Why? Because he had no sin and he's a greater high priest than Aaron could ever be. He passed through the heavens. Now, I'm going to stop here. But he gives us an exhortation. He says, as a result of that, he said, we ought to hold fast our profession of faith. He said, we need to cling to our 
profession or our confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, Lord willing, I may look at the Colossians 2.15 when Jesus passed through heaven. There's a word in Colossians where it said that when Jesus was trying to pass through heaven. See, listen, church, when Jesus resurrected from the grave and to sit on high, he was taking, listen, the blood of a sacrifice to put to lay on the altar, the Holy of Holies in the heavens. Look, look at Hebrews chapter 9. This is what he says he did. Look at verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, notice, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He entered once into the holy place, and he obtained eternal redemption for us. All those other sacrifices of blood, bulls, and goats and calves for all those thousand years, all they did was to cover sin into the one sacrifice, the one blood sacrifice that would take care of our sin for all of eternity. That was the God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, See, I want you to understand, Hebrew Christian, those who are listening, take heed to this message. We have a high priest that is passing to the heavens. And he says, Because of that, we need, to, we, we need to be careful and exhorted and challenged to hold on to what we believe about this man, Jesus Christ. Don't let it go. Cling to it, hold to it, retain it, keep it. Your profession, your confession of faith. Don't let anybody talk you out of it if you have it. And if you don't have it, you need to make sure you get it. For we have a high priest. Now, I like this next part, but I'm not going to preach it tonight. He said, we have a high priest that cannot be touched, which cannot be. Listen, we have, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. That, the phrase touch with the feelings, this one word, touch with the feelings of our infirmity. It means literally that he has felt and experienced everything that you will ever feel and experience. How bad, how good, how terrible it is. He says, I've, I've dealt with it. Listen, see the word touch. It means to be affected in the same way as somebody else is affected. He says, when you are weary, I've been tighter than you. When you're lonely, hurting, grieving, sorrowful, I've been there too. When you're needy, I've been there too. When you think nobody cares, I've been there too. I said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He said, I've been there too. He said, but because I'm that kind of high priest, I've been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He said, but, he said, but in all points of temper like we are, he said, yet without sin. We're going to look at that next week because I want to go back to Colossians chapter 2 and look at him passing through heaven and how the devils were trying to stop him, the principality of the powers. And it says, the word that's used, it said that he spoiled them and said like basically he was, they were trying to prevent him from going to offer the, the one sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice that would purchase eternal redemption for us and said that they were trying to stop him and it's like he was stripping them off. They could not prevent him from ascending on high to make an atonement. He came to fulfill the will of God and it said, listen, I want you to understand the, 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 the gravity of this. The demons, the principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places was trying to prevent Jesus Christ, our great high priest, from making atonement for our sins. And they brought all the forces of Satan, all the forces of hell against him to try to prevent him from ascending on high. Colossians says, and what Jesus did is made an open display. He showed the universe that they lost. I'm supreme. No, you can't handle me. Back off. So he was stripping them off. And when it's offered the blood of a sacrifice, and then it says, as they looked on, he sat down. He said, I'm done. And listen, not only was he done, he said, devil, you done too. That's who our God is. And that's why we serve him. He said, you can't fool me and pretend you love me and that you know me and you understand who I am and you won't worship me and serve me and do what I tell you to do because I've done too much for you. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Help us, Lord, I pray, to understand who we serve. 
who you are, what you've done, and what you can do. God help me never to think about serving anybody else or anything else but this God who's our great high priest that has passed into the heavens. And we'll thank you and praise you for it.